Um, hi everyone, today we have Yanni Liu and um, he will present his work on, on one-way functions and Komogor complexity. Let's welcome him. Yeah, thanks for introducing Lisa. Uh, hi again, everyone. Uh, my name is Yan Yi, and today I would like to talk about my work on one-way functions and Komogor complexity. And this is a joint work with Professor Rafael Pass at Cornell Tech. Uh, so that means, let me be very bold to summarize the history of cryptography in the last 2000 years. And our story begins with an artist who invents some scheme. And, you know, we have a new scheme and the people find, okay, all known attacks fail. And this scheme is deployed for primarily for military use. And finally, this game will be broken by someone and people are waiting for the next news game. So it seems that we have been going around in this cycle for a really long time and there is no scheme that is proved to be secure. And, and Diff so Diffie and Hammer in 76 proposed the genius notion of one-way functions, which gives us a way to jump out of the cycle and brings us into the age of enlightenment. And a function f is one way if it is easy to compute. So f can be computed in polynomial time and f is hard to invert. So no PPT machine can invert the function f. So we have given the input x, it's easy to compute the output f of x, but given the output f of x, it's hard to find the pre-image image x. And a famous example of when a function candidate is based on the factoring problem where we use the input x to pick two large random primes p and q, and we simply output p times q. And since we know that, uh, or we believe factoring a multiplicative of uh, multiplication of two large primes is hard, so therefore this function is believed to be one way. And more formally, we say that f is a one way function if given a random uh, string x of n bits, we compute y equals f of x. And for any PPT algorithm A, the probability that A on inputs one to the n comma y finds a pre-image is at most a negligible amount. And the good news is that y functions are known to be both necessary and sufficient for a branch of private key crypto primitives, such as private key encryption, pseudorandom generators, digital signatures, and so on. Uh, although PKE, MPC, and obfuscation are not included, whether one way function exists is the most important problem in cryptography. And let us consider the consequences of the existence of one way function. And the observation here is that the existence of one way function implies MP is worst case hard. And to see why this is the case, I would just consider any wave function f, and we can think of the, of the problem uh, to invert this function f as a MP search problem. So given an instance of f of x, we are asked to find the pre-image x. And since MP is equal to p, and we know that this MP search problem can be solved in polynomial time, and therefore wave function does not exist. However, as, as proposed in Diffie and Hammer in, by Diffie and Hammer in 76, our holy grail is to show that the converse is true. That is to prove and the worst case hardness of MP implies the existence of one-way functions. And of course, this problem is a, a really a hard question, is a really hard problem. And there are a lot of partial black box separations between the worst case hardness of MP and the existence of one functions. And therefore, in the absence of the holy grail, people have tried to base one functions on a different computational assumptions where we assume like certain computational problem is hard for polynomial time algorithms. And so, for example, we have factoring problem, we have discrete algorithm problem, and more recently, we have lattice problems. And in practice, we also have those hierarchically designed one function construction, such as DES, SHA, and AES. 
so far, these primitives have not been broken. But the question is for how long? Cryptographer still doesn't sleep well, said Mikali in 88. You know, so if you have some skin, like you are always worried about uh, being, uh, being broken. And furthermore, we know that if we have quantum computers, then the factoring problem and this quadratic logarithm problem are easy and can be solved by a quantum computer imposing over time. So the question here is, have we really escaped from the ancient crypto cycle where we going like we going around and around again? And the central question here is that does there exist some natural average case hard problem that characterizes the existence of quantum functions? And our main theorem says for any polynomial that t that is at least 1.1n, when we functions exist if and only if t time bounded comorbid complexity is mildly hard on average. And let us introduce the notion of comorbid complexity. I consider the following two strings. The first one is like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and so on. And second one is like one, seven, three, and something, something. So the question is which of the above strings is more random? And the notion of comorbid complexity is used to measure the amount of randomness in a fixed string. So we, for any string x, we let k of x denote the length of the shortest program that outputs the string x. And as we can see, the first string, one, two, three, one, two, three, and so on, can be easily, you know, we write a for loop and print one, two, three, once and once, once and again, and we can produce this string by a very short program. And more formally, we fix a universal Turing machine U. And we are looking for the length of the shortest program pi, which consists of M and W, such that the universal Turing machine U, when simulated on inputs M comma W, will output X. And the notion of comorbid complexity has a lot of amazing applications, such as proving Godel's incompleteness theorem. But unfortunately, this is uncomputable. And therefore, we look into the notion of time bounded comorbid complexity, and we let kt of x denote the length of the shortest program that outputs x within time t of length of x. And we can see this kt of x is, uh, is of course, computable. And when t is a polynomial, this problem is actually in NP. And so the question here is can kt be efficiently computed? When even when t is a polynomial. And this problem has been studied in the Soviet Union since the 60s. And also independently by Hadmarnis, Sipser, and Co. in the 80s. And it is closely related to the minimal circuit size problem. And let us introduce the notion of average case hardness of Kt. And this, this Actually, this question is, was also studied in the 60s in the Soviet Union, and they call it a frequential version of computing KT. And the question is, asks, does there exist an algorithm that computes KT of X for a large fraction of axes? And the, obser the observation here, also made in the 60s, is that KT can be approximated within an additive factor of log n with probability one minus one over n. And the algorithm is very simple. We just output n. And to see why this is a good approximation, uh, we first present a upper bound. So we consider any string x. We first claim that the kt complexity of any string x is at most n plus of one, where this n is the length of the string. And to see why this is the exact case, just consider some uh, length, like programming language. Let's say, just consider Python. And to produce a string x, the easiest way is just a program print x. And this program takes a n plus c bits to describe, where we use n bits to hardwire the string x. And the rest, the c bits, is used for 
uh, to write down the command print. So we conclude that for any string x, the kt complexity of x is at most uh, m plus c. And then we pr present a lower bound. So we claim that for uh, there are at least a one over n fraction of strings that have kt complexity smaller than n minus of log n. And we just consider any order true machine of, of length n minus log n. So there are at most two to the power of n minus log n such true machines. So therefore, the fraction of strings that uh, have small have kt complexity at least n minus log n is at most uh, two to the n minus log n over two to the n is at most uh, one over n. So we conclude that with probability one minus one over n, the kt complexity of a random string is at most n minus log n. Mm, and combining these two claims, we conclude that this simple outputting n approximation is indeed a good approximation. And I will stop here uh, for some questions. And uh, please go ahead if you have some questions. OK. OK, now, so now we have this observation that the KT can be approximated within an additive factor of log n with probability one minus one over n. So let's discuss the definition of KT is mildly hard on average. So we say that KT is mildly hard on average if there exists a polynomial P such that OPPT heuristic H can compute KT with probability one minus one over PN over random strings X for infinitely many N. And we say KT is mildly hard on average to C approximate if there exists a polynomial P such that no PPT heuristic H can C approximate KT with probability at least one minus one over P of N over random strings X for infinitely many N. And we are ready to present our main theorem. So we showed that the following are equivalent. First, one of functions exists. And second, there exists polynomial T such that KT is mildly hard on average. And third, for all constants C epsilon and polynomial T, KT is mildly hard on average to C log n approximate. So we have the following two direct corollaries here. And the first corollary says that for any polynomial T that is at least 1.1n, when functions exist, if and only if KT is mildly hard on average. So this corollary characterizes the existence of one-way functions. And the second corollary says that for any constant C comma epsilon comma T and any polynomial T that is at least one plus epsilon N, we show that KT is mildly hard on, to, hard on average to C log N approximate if and only if KT is mild, hard on, mildly hard on average. So this corollary basically shows that uh, approximating KT on average uh, is, is roughly the same as computing KT on average. Okay, any, any question here? Okay, then let's move on. So let us mention some early connections between the, the existence of one function and KT. And first we know that the existence of one function implies there exists a polynomial T such that KT is worst case hard. And the converse direction is not known. And this will be our starting point to showing that the existence of, of one function implies KT is hard on average. So here we know it's like worst case hard. And in this work, we will show it's average case hard. And second, sensor 19 shows that uh, under a new conjecture, MCSP is errorless hard on average if and only if one function exists. And as mentioned, this uh, minimal circuit size problem is closely related to KT. Uh, however, our results are unconditional. And we show that the existence of one function is unconditionally equivalent to KT being mildly hard on average. Okay, let's move on to the proofs. And in the paper, we will show that uh, the second uh, implies the first, and the first implies the third, and the third item trivially implies the second. 
So for today, we just sketch the proof of equivalence between the first item and the second bullet. So, so let's first discuss the proof for theorem one, uh, which says assume there exists a polynomial t that is uh, such that kt is mildly hard on average, then when we functions exist. And we know that to show when we functions exist, uh, it suffice to show weak when we function exists. And we say that f is a weak when we function if a uh, no PPT machine can invert f with probability one minus one over p of n for infinitely many n and some polynomial p. And by Yao's hardness amplification lemma, we know that if a weak one we function exists, then a one we function exists. So we just need to construct a weak one we function. And let's show our, let me show our construction. So we first let C be the constant such that KT of X is at most the length of X plus C for all X. So recall that we can always print the string by writing the program print X. So here the C is basically the length of the command print. Okay, so let's fix C as a constant and we define the function F on input pi prime comma I where this pi prime is a n plus C bit string and this I is a log n plus C bit string. And so we first let this let pi be the first I base of pi prime. That is we truncate pi prime to its first I base. And then we let y be the output of pi after, so we view pi as a program and we run pi for t of n steps. And we let this y denote the output of pi. And finally, the weak one function f simply outputs i concatenated with y. So this is our uh, one function construction. And we will show that this is indeed a weak one function. So we assume for contradiction that this f is not a weak one function. And then for any inverse polynomial delta, we know that there exists a PPT attacker A that inverse the function f with probability one minus delta. And we construct a heuristic H using the one-way function inverter A that computes kt with probability one minus delta times all of n. Since this delta can be a arbitrary inverse polynomial, uh, this concludes that kt is not mildly hard on average, uh, which is a contradiction. Okay, let's see our reduction. Mm, our heuristic H proceeds as follows. So we are given a string Y of n bits, and our goal is to compute the kt complexity of Y. So basically the smallest program that outputs Y. So the first step is to enumerate i from one to n plus c. And for each i, we run the inverter a on input i concatenate with y. So if this inverter succeeds, uh, it should return a program pi such that pi produces y and the length of pi is at most i. However, the inversion doesn't always succeed. So we have to check whether this program pi indeed outputs the string y within t of n steps. And finally, we output the smallest i for which the above check pass. So intuitively, if this inverter a succeeds with very high probability, and then it should also succeed with high probability conditioned on length i for every i in n plus c. But the problem is that we are feeding h a, so the problem is that H is feeding the inverter A the wrong distribution over Y. So let's look at where the problem is. And so in this one, so first recall that in one way function experience where our inverter A is, is guaranteed to work. So I is a random, is a random length from like from one to N plus C. And so the string y is the output of a random program of length i. However, in the emulation by H of in the KT experiments, and this is a scenario where we, we want to show that the inverter A works. 
So H is fitting A, a fixed I, where I is fixed to the KT complexity of Y. And Y here, however, is a uniform string. So note that in the first experiment, Y is the output of a random program. And in the second experiment, Y is a uniform string. So this is a problem. Uh, since we have no reason to believe that uh, the output of random program will be close to uniform. Uh, however, uh, we will use a counting argument to show that they are not too far in relative distance. So what, do, what did we do? The key idea is uh, let us first assume for simplicity that the y function inverter is deterministic. And we consider some string y on which this heuristic edge fails. So basically y has probability mass two to the minus n in the KT experiment. So with probability two to the power of minus n, a random string will hit y. So for this edge y to fail, the inverter A must fail on input W concatenate with Y, where this W is KT of Y. So if A succeeds, then of course this H won't make, make a mistake, so A must fail. However, we look at the probability that this pair W comma Y is sampled in the one-way function experiment. So in this experiment, we know with probability one over M plus C, where a random i will hit this w. And since y is a output of rand a random program of length i, and we are choosing a random program, so, so this y is hit with probability two to the minus w. And this probability, we know it's at least one over n times two to the minus n. So if this heuristic edge fails with probability epsilon, then this inverter will fill with probability epsilon over n, which is, which is assumed to be delta. So we conclude that h fails with probability at most delta times of n. So which states that this h is a good heuristic of computing kt on average, and this kt is not mildly hot on average, which is a contradiction. So, uh, so we show that this one-way function is a weak one-way function. And uh, any question here? Okay, if there's no question, I will just move on. Okay, so we have seen the proof for theorem one, which says assume there exists some polynomial t such that kt is mildly hard on average, then one-way functions exist. Then let us look into the proof of theorem two, which says assume one functions exist. Then there exists some polynomial t at t such that kt is mildly hard on average. And our high level idea is first to use a one way function f to construct a pure g g that maps m bit to a two m bit string. And second, we use the algorithm H for computing KT to distinguish the outputs of the PRG from random, where this T is set to be the running time of G. And this yards a contradiction. So let us uh, look, at, so let us look at how to uh, use this algorithm H to break the PRG. So on, on input a uniform string, we know that a uniform string has large commodal capacity with high probability. Uh, this is because you know just the number of true the number of true emotion of length two n minus of log n is at most uh, two to the power of n minus two n minus of log n, which uh, is sparse among uh, among like the strings of two n strings of of length two n. So on, uniform, on uniform inputs, we conclude that the commodal complexity of a uniform string is, is high with high probability. However, on, on input a pseudo-random sample, so if y is sampled from g of un, we know that the commodal complexity of y is at most n plus of one with probability one. And to see why this is the case, 
So to consider to output this string y, we need to first hardwire the seed of the student of the PRG, which takes n bits. And we should also have the code of the PRG, which takes off one bit. So to generate the string y, we just need the seed of the PRG and the code of PRG. So in, in a sense, any algorithm edge that computes KT can break the PRG, since random strings have high comorbid complexity and the pseudo-random strings have small comorbid complexity. However, we, we highlight here that this intuition only works if this heuristic edge computes KT with probability one. And if edge is just a heuristic that works with probability, with overwhelming probability, then we have no guarantees. So this heuristic edge can simply fail on all pseudo-random strings as they all have tiny probability mass. And to see why this is the case, Consider that there are at most two to the n pseudo random strings, and there are two to the two n strings in total. So the probability mass of the pseudo random string is just two to the n over two to the two n, which is tiny. And the heuristic can just avoid all pseudo random strings. So to solve this problem, we rely on a notion of entropy preserving PRG. So an uh, entropy preserving PRG is an efficiently computable function that maps n bits to n plus c log n bits. And it has two properties. So first, it satisfies the pseudo-randomness property. And we ask g of u n should be indistinguishable from u, from u n plus c log n. And second, g should have entropy preserving property, where we ask g of u n has the channel entropy at least a minus of log n. And we will show that the existence of entropy prism PRG with running time t implies kt is mildly hard on average. And the intuition behind this construction is that if the channel entropy in G of un is at least a minus of log n, so it's like it's relatively dense, so it hits sufficiently many points on which the heuristic edge succeeds in computing KT. And we are showing the proof that if G is an entropy preserving PRG, then the output of H of Y is smaller than N, minus N plus of one with probability of one over N squared, given the pseudo random samples. And this will conclude that uh, uh, this will conclude that uh, the entropy the entropy preserving PRG with running time t implies KT is mildly hard on average. So it remains it remains to construct a entropy preserving PRG from one way function. So the good news here is that the gold rich and Leven construction of a PRG from a one way permutation is entropy preserving, and to see why this is the case, recall the construction G takes S comma R as input, and it outputs R as it is. It also outputs F of S, where F is a one-way permutation, and S is just uh, the seed. And it also outputs some Goldrich and Levin hardcore bits. And uh, we can observe that uh, R together with S of S give us entropy and n bits entropy. However, the bad news is that uh, the here 99 construction of a PRG from a one-way function is not entropy preserving as far as we can tell. And we also don't know how to obtain an entropy preserving PRG from a one-way function. And I guess there's possibly black, like black box separation between the entropy preserving PRG and one-way functions. So we need to relax the notion of the entropy preserving PRG. And so what we need is called a conditionally secure entropy preserving PRG, where this uh, where, where the pseudo-random property and entropy preserving property hold only conditioned on some event E. So we ask 
g of u n condition on some event e is indistinguishable from u n plus c log n. And g of u n condition on some event e has channel entropy at least n minus of log n for some event e. And we can show that the existence of conditionally secure entropy preserving PRG with running time t implies kt is mildly hot on average. So basically, the same proof as before just works here. So let us construct a conditionally secure entry preserving PRG. And we will show that the existence of one function implies the existence of conditionally secure entry preserving PRG. And the proof, in the proof, we first use a variant of PRG from regular random function. And we show that this construction actually satisfies our notion of a con conditionally secure EPPRG when use any one-way function. So what's the construction? Uh, the construction G takes S comma R1, comma R2, comma R3, comma I as inputs, and it outputs R1, comma R2, R3, comma R3 as, as it is, uh, because there are seeds. And it output, it applies a randomness extractor on S with seed at R1 and truncates the output to the first I minus all of log n bits. And it also applies a randomness extractor on F of S with seed R2 and truncates the output to a minus I minus all of log n bits. And finally, it outputs some gold rich and living hot core bits. And we remarked that this is not a PRG actually, but it is a PRG and is also entry preserving conditioned on the event that I comma S is good. And by I comma S is good, we mean that S has regularity R that is most common. So S has the most common regularity R and this I is equal to the most reg common regularity R. So if I come as is good, this will ensure that those extractors work. And finally, let us see, uh, let us see how many entropy it has. So we can see that these two together has a channel entropy at least n minus of log n. Uh, since from the first extractor, we have channel entropy roughly i minus of log n, and the second extractor gives us uh, roughly n minus i minus of log n base entropy, and they together give us a channel entropy n minus of log n bits. Yeah, so therefore uh, we can construct a count EPPRG from a one-way function. And uh, any question here? Okay, if there's no question, then I, we have seen the proof to theorem two, uh, which says assume when functions exist, then there exists some polynomial t such that kt is mildly hard on average. And let us, in conclusion, our main theorem says that for any epsilon, any epsilon, any, any polynomial t that is at least one plus epsilon, when functions exist if and only if kt is mildly hard on average. And this is the first natural average case problem characterizing the feasibility of the basic tasks in crypto. And let us mention some recent results on KT. And uh, Hilhala 18 presents a worst case to average case reduction for KT. And they show that uh, KT is errorless hard on average if KT is worst case hard to approximate. And however, our result doesn't does not extend to errorless hard on average. And in some, uh, in some recent paper of, our, of ours, we show that this MCKTP is MP hard. So this MCKP, MCKTP is a minimal conditional commodal capacity problem. And we also show that the existence of one functions can be based on sublinear time average case hardness of MKTP. And finally, let me end this talk by summarizing our progress 
towards the holy grail. So our starting point is that NP is hard for BPP. And by LP21, we know that MCKTP is hard for BPP. And Hilahala 18 presents a worst case to average case reduction in which he shows if KT is hard to approximate for BPP, then KT is errorless hard on average. And by what we have seen today, we know that if KT is mildly hard on average, then Y functions exist. So those two red dash the arrows are missing implications. So if we can show that MCKTP is hard for is hard for BPP, it implies that KT is hard to approximate for BPP. And if we can show KT is errorless hard on average, it implies KT is mild hard on average, then we can finally base the existence of one function on MP is not equal to P. Yeah, so thank you for listening to the talk and questions are welcome. Um, Yanni, I think there is a question in the chat. Oh, I in chat? Okay. Just Can you see it or should I read it for you? Oh, just for how it's KT defined in the worst case. Okay, in the worst case, uh, Uh, so the recorder that basically kt of x asks the length of shortest program that outputs the string x within time t of length of x. And so in average, we just, uh, so we ask, uh, so if it's hard on average, then uh, we mean there's no, no PPT edge that computes kt with probability one minus one over p of n. So in worst case, so if KT is, uh, let's say it's worst case easy, then uh, there should exist a PPT that computes KT with probability one. So for, so basically for any X, uh, it should output KT of X. Uh, so, that's, so that's KT defined in worst case. And our result is indeed a average to average reduction since we start by we start with the assumption that uh, KT is is hard, uh, so KT is mildly hard on average. So where this randomness is taken over uh, a random choice of string X. So uh, by KT is not mildly hard on average. We uh, is by KT is mildly hard on average. We mean there's no algorithm that computes KT of X for a large fraction of X. So like in conclusion, uh, if KT is defined in the worst case, then for any string X, you have to compute KT of X. And uh, which, uh, which is not true in, in my talk. And second, yes, I, our result is an average to average reduction. Yeah, does that answer your question? Okay, Yanni, I have a question. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Have, so uh, in the proof of your theorem two, it yes. seems that if you had uh, one way permutations, that would already be enough to imply KT is mildly hard on average. Uh, yes. Yes, because uh, by using this construction due to Goldrack Levin. I'm, I'm yes. curious if you guys considered whether uh, any strengthening of KT implies one way permutations, like going the other way around. Uh, yeah, this is a good question. And uh, uh, yes, we did consider this, but we didn't get anywhere. Yeah, so I guess it's KT. Uh, yeah, we don't really know if it implies the existence of when we permutation. And I think we don't even know how to get a regular when we function. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah, thank I see. you.
another question was uh, maybe I misunderstood this, but you seem to require that the output of the PRG should have Shannon entropy at least n minus log n. Yes. Uh, so maybe maybe this is a stupid question, but uh, if the seed is already n bits long, doesn't the output already have n bits of entropy? Yeah. Uh, not necessarily. Yeah, this is a good question too. And uh, the point is, let's say if you don't have a one-way permutation, and uh, so basically this PRG could be shrinking. So uh, like you probably have like a lot of pre-images that map to a single point. Uh -huh, I uh, see. Let me come up with an example. Mm. Yeah, maybe this is not a correct example, but uh, you can say if here, if in this construction, if this f is not a one-way permutation, right? If it's just a, a one-way function, right. then uh, f of s doesn't contain like high enough entropy. Because like when, if you have, let's say, like multiple prime images that map to like a single point or like a single output, then this f of s, you know, doesn't have like high enough entropy. I see, I see. Yeah, makes sense, thanks. Uh, okay, another question is, uh, sorry about that. Um, sorry for uh, hogging no the worry. time. If somebody has another question, you should go for it. Um, yeah, I guess you can go ahead. Okay, so uh, again, this is uh, uh, the way you prove the upper bound for KT. You said that KT of X is at most N plus constant and uh, yes. kind of the upper bound was just do print X. Yes. Uh, but this seems to be very much dependent on the under, underlying computational model, right? If you if you think about a pro underlying computational model is uh, something that compiles a Python program, then sure. But if it's uh, running on a native execution, uh, you probably could expect like hundred um, n or or something that is multiple that depends multiplicative in terms of n, right? Um, so uh, um, yes and no. Uh, uh, so actually, in the paper, so like formally, uh, basically for Turing machines. Uh, like you can just consider like a empty program and so and on the tape of the Turing machine, uh, you just uh -huh. you just write down the string you want to output on the tape of the Turing machine. And the program, you, you just leave the program like uh, you just leave the program to be like a, a immediately hot program or like a in, immediately terminates problem, program. So uh, in more detail, uh, so record that the true machine is basically defined by two parts. So first we have like a machine M and this W is actually like the contents on the tape. So when, when you specify a true machine, like you always specify the machine itself and also the memory contents on the tape. So to print the any string X, you just leave M M to be like a stupid Turing machine, uh, which does which does nothing, and W is just like the string you want to output. Okay, so, that makes sense. That's the same as the print example, I guess. Yes, yeah, but yeah. Okay. for other computation model, yeah, I think yeah, what you said could happen, uh, but you know, like we just consider, yeah, I get, like we are theoretical computer scientists, we just compute consider Turing machines, yeah, but. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this this requirements like uh, you can print any string by using like a print x uh, commander. Like, I think it's not a crazy assumption, or it's not a crazy thing to like to ask. So basically, uh, I think like uh, like those reasonable computational model like should have this property. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. And a yeah. great talk. Yeah, good questions. Um, Janine, I believe there is a follow up to the first question and also like a, another one uh, in the yeah. chat. Sorry. Okay. Uh, is it all X versus random X? Do you believe? Uh, to your first question, uh, yes. It's, it's for, for all X versus random X. Uh, like in worst case, it should work for all X 
And in every case, it just works for random x. And uh, worst case to average is reduction. Yeah, I believe it's possible. Uh, it's just that we, we don't know how to get it, but uh, I think it should be possible given like so many crazy things happening here. And thank you for your questions too. Yeah, thanks. Okay, if there are no more questions, then uh, thank you for the great talk, Yanni, and uh, uh, congrats on the very cool work. Thanks, everyone.